Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I'm very privileged to be able to chair this prestigious panel this afternoon. My name is Jody Jensen. I, um, I direct the MA program in International Studies at the University of Pannonia and Kurseg, and I also direct the research center, the Polanyi Center, at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Kurseg. I wanted to begin with just a short introduction today, um, and I wanted to say at the beginning that the world has reached a tipping point. In fact, and I'm sure many of you saw the, the uh, television uh, program that showed we had 90 seconds to midnight um, in the last report. Um, I think that we are in a period of interregnum between the verge of, or of collapse of one world system and a new world system in Emmanuel Wallerstein's terms. And I think that Professor Surlishi brought up complex systems this morning and I wanted to um, reiterate that the more complex and more interconnected the system is, the more fragile the system becomes. And as a result of its interconnectivity and its interdependence, the more fragile it becomes. So civilizations collapse due to um, interconnected conditions of political and social unrest, natural catastrophes, environmental crises and migration, pandemics and war, and the inability of institutions to mitigate these problems. The more rigid the system and the structures, the greater the chance of their collapse. So I'd li I like to use the term chaotic age. Um, we were using an age of uncertainty, but I like the use of chaotic because it combines those elements of both chaos and order. Um, this interregnum period, however chaotic it may be, allows for more human intervention, more free will, according to Emmanuel Wallerstein, because we are not bound by the rules of the old order or the, or, or the rules of the new order, which we cannot yet see. So I also wanted to bring up a point that I think that we all participate in a system of dysfunctional thinking and denial. And I always ask myself the question when confronted with a new crisis, like the war, why are we always reacting after crisis strike and not preparing for them in advance? We have so many experts on so many different subjects, and I always wonder why we are always reacting and not proactive. So I think our first speaker will address some of these issues um, this afternoon. And I'd like to introduce you, first of all, Sir Richard Sharif, who is the former NATO Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. In 2016, he published the book entitled 2017 War with Russia, an urgent warning from senior military command. And I think you were very brave to put it in the context of a novel, which is much more digestible for more people. Um, the book is part fictional and suggests how Russia could easily invade the Baltic states, that war between Russia and NATO is possible and that we are unprepared of delivering a capable response. In the prologue, um, Mr. Sharif quotes Trotsky, and he says, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. So now I would like to give the floor to Richard Sharif. Well, Jody, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be with you here in Vesprem, and I'd very much like to thank uh, Ferenc and uh, my, my guide and host, and uh, who's been organizing it all, uh, Dr. Ivana Stepanovich, for, for, for making it all possible. Um, it, what is particular pleasure is that this is such a, a broad international community, and I'm, in that context, Delighted to meet a couple uh, of attendees from the country of my birth, Kenya. Um, because it just also, not only is it great to meet Ken fellow Kenyans, and if, if I may presume to say that, I lived there until I was born there and lived there until I was eight. But it just widens the aperture away from any discussion about 
what many of you who are not from Europe might think of as a European problem. In other words, the, the Russo-Ukraine war. In the last 12 months or so, as well as the war in Ukraine, there has been a catastrophic war and it continues in Tigray between Ethiopia and, and, and the Tigrayans, aided and abetted by the Eritreans. Over half a million casualties. And we don't have to go back very far to the civil war in DRC and the Congo with over five million casualties. So you may well say, well, what's so special about this? Where was Europe when Africa was suffering and is suffering these wars? And it's a very good question. I have no answers to that, suffice it to say, except that it is like, it's, it's about self-interest. But I think there's a wider point here. It's about the, the means and the capability of the international community, principally the United Nations, to control, prevent, resolve that scourge of war. <coughs> and what makes the Russia-Ukraine war so pernicious, perhaps in international context, is the fact that the prosecutor of that war, Russia, is also a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council and a signatory to the UN Charter of Human Rights. So I think we need to re recall that. This did not come out of a clear blue sky. <coughs> and I want to take you back to the Kremlin in March, March the 14th precisely, 2014, March the 18th, 2014, which was the day that Russia incorporated Crimea into the Russian Federation. And in, outside in Red Square, Putin waved, uh, people waved banners. Glory to Russia, glory to Putin. And inside, Putin made a speech, which continued a theme we probably first heard in public or in international context at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. And I want to remind you, of course, that here is the man who described that the breakup of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century and the man who has since called for a new Yalta as the most appropriate security settlement for Europe. And here in Hungary, which of course was in many ways a victim of the old Yalta, I suspect those words carried particular resonance. In that speech, he majored on the West the threat poses to Russia. And I quote, time and again, we were deceived. Time and again, decisions were made behind our backs. And the same happened when they made, in other words, NATO, made their expansion to the east with the deployment of military structures on our borders. A fact, Secretary of State Baker, when Germany reunified, said NATO would not move troops into the former East Germany. And that did not happen. Nothing was said about free, democratic, newly, uh, new states that emerged out of the, the old Warsaw Pact, putting themselves forward for, NATO, for NATO membership voluntarily and being satisfying the criteria for NATO membership and being accepted. He set that grievance in a historical context to make it resonate more. We have all the reasons to believe, he said, that the policy of containment of Russia that was happening in the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th centuries is still going on. And he warned the West to expect Russia to push back. If you press the spring, it will release at some point something you should remember. As for Ukraine, we are not just neighbors. We are one nation. Kiev is the mother of Russian cities, and what he described as the latest events in Ukraine were the product of terror, murder, pogroms conducted by anti-Semites, Russophobes, nationalists, and neo-Nazis, language which has continued to emanate from the poison in the Kremlin. And his vision for the future, uniting Russian speakers under Russia is the desire of the people. The absolute majority of the people is clear 95% of the Russian population think that Russia should protect the interests of Russians, even if it will worsen our relations with some states. And, of course, he was predictably reassuring about the future of Ukraine and what he calls other regions, by which we can infer 
He means other states with significant Russian ethnic minorities. Don't trust those who frighten you with Russia, he said, those who say that Crimea will be followed by other regions. We do not want to split Ukraine. Well, he was right. He doesn't want to split Ukraine. He wants Ukraine as part of a new Putin-Russian empire. And his deeds have matched his words, the annexation of Crimea. That expectation in 2014, March 2014, that he was on the point of invading Ukraine as he assembled tank armies and airborne divisions and outloaded ammunition and other logistics and built field hospitals, presaging an offensive operation into Ukraine. Actually, what we then saw was the proxy wars in Donetsk and Luhansk and the war in Ukraine, which started in 2014 and before 24th of February last year, when he did invade, of course, as we all know, some 10,000 Ukrainians had already been killed in that war. And, effectively, a state of mind in the Kremlin with a, that, that said that the, that the Kremlin is at war with, with the rest and with NATO. And that's not me talking, that's Dmitry Trenin, who heads up the Carnegie Moscow Foundation, who wrote in 2016 that the Kremlin has been at war with the West since 2014. Well, what does he want? Number one, he wants Russia firmly established as a great power. He wants to re-establish a Russian empire in the former republics of the Soviet Union. First of all, wiping Ukraine off the map as a sovereign state. And then I'm, th I'm sure that he would have done if he could and will continue to do if he can at some stage in the future, turn his attention to Georgia, to Moldova, and quite possibly uh, to the Baltic states. And of course, he's already got 20% of Georgia since the invasion of 2008. And the only thing that's stopping him of that, of course, is the fact that he has been, his armed forces have been effectively fixed in Ukraine. He absolutely wants to see the destruction of NATO, an alliance he sees as a direct threat to Russia, and he absolutely wants to decouple America from European defence. But let's be clear about this. Putin is a blood-stained tyrant who has afflicted unspeakable pain and suffering on a democratic, peaceful neighbour. But in a real sense, it takes two to tango. And if NATO and if the West had behaved differently, we perhaps might not be here where we are right now. So it's perhaps worth going over the last few years because it has implications for the way we behave in future. I would highlight the cumulative defence cuts, particularly in Western Europe and the Western European NATO countries, and I'd include Canada in that, so one transatlantic partner is not completely off the hook, which have sent a message of weakness. That Bucharest summit, NATO Bucharest summit in 2007, with the promise of NATO membership to Ukraine and to Georgia, you either make a promise and you back it up, or you don't make the promise in the first place. And if we look back to the context of 2007, a promise of NATO membership would have meant that unconditional guarantee of collective defense article under Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which says an attack, an armed attack on one is an attack on all. And to ensure Ukrainian or Georgian security under those terms would have meant NATO being ready to put troops on the ground in Ukraine, aircraft in the skies above Ukraine and Georgia to deter Russian attack. And in the context of 2007, that is very, very difficult to have seen. So perhaps that promise was a promise too far. Georgia, 2008. In many ways, I think, our Rhineland moment, and by our Rhineland moment, I'm referring to Hitler's reoccupation of the Rhineland in 1936, which was the first time, in a sense, the newly, relatively new Nazi regime began to wave its stick and the West let it get on with it. And indeed, after 2008, NATO returned to business as usual. And in 2010, the NATO strategic concept stated that Russia should become our most important strategic partner. The UK Defence Review of 2010, in a particular 
UK context, which said there is no existential threat to these islands. And that subsequent dismantling of Western NATO warfighting capability. And to be honest, the sound of chickens coming home to roost right now on that score is deafening. I would highlight that red line that Obama drew in the sand, metaphorically speaking, over the use of chemical weapons in Syria in 2013. And when they were used, oh well, it's one of those things. The US withdrawal from military capability from Europe. And indeed, the, and to a certain extent, that focus on the Asia-Pacific region, which is understandable for American foreign policy concerns, but I would also highlight, suggest that American security is not only European security, but European security is also American security. And the Trump years. Trump was right on one thing when he called to account NATO member states for failing to meet that 2% minimum of GDP on defence. But equally, his treatment of the alliance partners uh, with considerable contempt and his cozying up to adversaries also sent a signal. I would highlight that statement by President Macron that NATO is brain dead. That's a comment on France as much as anybody because NATO is no more, no less than the sum of the now 30 member states which make it up. And I would also highlight the catastrophe of the collapse of the NATO mission in Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, which I think had a direct bearing on the timing of the invasion of Ukraine. Of course, that collapse was effectively President Biden pulling the rug unilaterally from under what was a NATO mission without any discussion or consultation uh, with his allies, all sending a message that NATO is a busted flush. Well, Friday, of course, is the 12-month anniversary of the launch of this war, <coughs> in which Putin, but not only Putin, made three fundamental miscalculations. Number one, that he failed to recognize, and I think many of us felt the same, I think all of us knew Ukrainians would fight like tigers, but I don't think anybody expected Ukraine under the leadership of President Zelensky to show such not only courage, resilience, determination, cleverness, agility. They have given us a master class in campaign design and campaign implementation. I don't think any of us expected the Russian armed forces to be quite as incompetent as they have been. They have consistently failed to demonstrate the most basic principles of an understanding of combined arms warfare, by which I mean to the non-military among you, that is bringing together the orchestra of different military capabilities in which one capability can offset the vulnerabilities of another to produce a concentrated synergistic effect. A failure of command, a failure of planning, a catastrophic failure of logistics, a sign of a kleptocratic corrupt state which has insidiously undermined its own military capability through corruption and kleptomania, and a failure of morale and discipline, all of which has led catastrophically, of course, to Plan B, the mass destruction, mass artillery, destruction of cities, the, uh, the destruction of, new, of Ukrainian power capabilities, the assault on cities and, of course, most grimly of all, the massacre of civilians, the use of mass rape as a weapon of war, the deportation of children and other civilians into Russia, effectively genocide. And the final miscalculation by Russia was the extent to which the West, and by which I mean NATO and other democratic states focused uh, opposing Russia have rallied to Ukraine's cause. And I think the story here is, if one was marking it, is good but could be better. Without that support from NATO, uh, and indeed of course the European Union, particularly on the financial side, Ukraine would not have been able to conduct the defense of its homeland uh, that the Ukrainians have done so impressively but more could be done. I think 
Looking back on it, if one had been asked last summer whether Western unity and NATO unity would be as strong in February 2023 that it has been, I think one of, would have raised doubts about that. The dependence on Russian energy, the impact of the, de the withdrawal of Russian energy over, a, 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 over the, the, the winter in Europe. Was all this going to be a presage to European nations pushing President Zelensky to accept some form of ceasefire? Thus far, it has not happened. That ringing declaration at the Madrid summit in September last year, the NATO Madrid summit, that NATO would continue to provide whatever, provide whatever support Ukraine needed to do the job, has maintained a pretty strong consensus thus far. Although I would highlight the fact that the provision of NATO support has been a dribble rather than a clout. We've seen that discussion, the hand wringing in certain countries, Germany particularly, about the provision of tanks. And many countries, of course, within NATO, not providing any military support at all, although many have really gone, a whole, gone, gone the whole hog as much as possible. But talk of a negotiated ceasefire is still there, perhaps, in the media and in certain sectors. But at the moment, officially, it's off the table. As for the campaign itself, I think that dribbling of resources in has coloured where we are in the campaign. We saw stunning Ukrainian successes last year. The battle for Kiev, which sent the Russians packing back into Belarus. The, the offensive, the summer offensive northeast uh, of Kharkiv, again, sent the Russians in headlong retreat and regained significant amount of Ukrainian territory. The liberation of Kherson in the south, where the Ukrainians targeted Russian logistics, Russian routes, logistics supply routes across the, the Dnipro River. And this was a classic in a sense because it forced the, the, uh, the Russians to withdraw of their own accord without the Ukrainians needing to put in what would have been a grim attritional fight in the city of Kherson. But there's a number of what ifs. If the West had given the Ukrainians the means to prosecute uh, an offensive earlier, if there hadn't been some invidious distinction between defensive weapons and offensive weapons, as an ex-soldier I will tell you, the best means of defense is attack. Maybe, just maybe, the Ukrainians may have been in a position uh, to capitalize on, that, on their success in the south at Kherson and may have been in a position while the Russians were in, in some disarray, they might have been able to attack and gain even more ground. But since then, we've seen the initial chaos of the Russian mobilization of large numbers of young men and indeed not so young men steady. We've seen reinforcement. Uh, we've seen these grim attritional battles in the, in the Donbass, in Luhansk, Bakhmut, and Solidar. Some Russian tactical successes, albeit at the cost of casualties of killed on a scale which would not look out of place to anybody who had seen the battlefield of Verdun or the Somme or Passchendaele in the First World War. But meanwhile, of course, the Russians have also managed to dig and prepare extensive defensive positions in the south, which is going to make any further Ukrainian successes even more complicated and even more difficult. So where is it going to go? Well, I think the situation is pretty balanced at the moment. There is a Russian offensive ongoing at the moment in the center, in the, in the eastern Donbass. On the face of it, two divisions sounds like a significant force. But all the intelligence, and there is a plethora of open source intelligence, which is pretty well analyzed, pretty well validated, and pretty well corroborated. And I think one can take 
uh, you know, the, its assessments, as much of the assessments, particularly the assessments by the Institute for the Study of Warfare, is pretty near the truth. Most assessments say that the Russians lack the resources and the capability and the equipment to turn those, that offensive into something decisive. Bear in mind, the Russians are losing casualties. On one assessment I saw, 800 plus killed a day. They probably lost half the tank fleet they had before the war started. Over a thousand tanks destroyed, some 500 captured. Now, the, you can't make up those losses that easily. So the Russians are on the offensive at the moment. Where will this go? Well, it all depends on a number of variables. Number one is logistics and ammunition. This is a war that is demanding ammunition expenditures on a scale not seen since the Second World War. Vast numbers of ammunition, and of course, in most Western countries providing support to uh, Ukraine. Assumptions about daily expenditure of ammunition rates were dramatically downscaled as a result of the years since the end of the Cold War, when the assumption of a threat of industrial state-on-state -state warfare had rather gone away, or at least was deeply unfashionable. Many of us thought differently, but nevertheless, that's where we are. So industry is not tooled up to produce the ammunition on the scale required to support uh, the Ukrainians as they need to support if they are to mount a really meaningful offensive. So other means have to be found. I would also say that the ability to mobilize, train and deploy troops by both Ukraine and by Russia is critical. We have seen that scooping up, that mobilization by Russia, 300,000 young men pulled up off the streets, given absolutely no proper training at all. 11 days later, they're in the firing line and they've been dying in droves. Meanwhile, Ukraine is also mobilizing, has also mobilized and is training significant numbers of its, of its, of its people. And other countries in the West have also been providing that training as well. So it's about how quickly the Ukrainians can assimilate equipment, train its soldiers in the use of that equipment, put in place the logistic support, and the logistic demands are massive. And you can just imagine the challenge faced by any Ukrainian technical quartermaster when he's, off, when he's asked to provide logistic support for two or three different sorts of tank, two or three different sorts of armed vehicle, as well as the training challenges as well, are, are significant. So that ability to mobilize more quickly than the enemy is going to be critical to the success uh, of Ukraine or indeed of Russia. And variable number three is the willingness of the West to provide more sophisticated ground and indeed air offensive capabilities to Ukraine. Thus far, a stepped approach, I call it dribbling in, has been the marker. We're getting over one barrier after another. We're over the barrier of tanks. When will we get over the barrier of fighter aircraft? But remember, of course, the provision of fighter aircraft is not an immediate panacea. You can't just say to the Ukrainians, here's a bunch of F-16s, go ahead, use them. It takes months, if not years, to train the pilots and months, if not years, to put in place the logistics and the capabilities to support complex, sophisticated uh, NATO standard for, uh, air, uh, offensive aircraft. But it's also about providing the capability for long range precision missiles and the like, all the means to allow Ukraine to put together an offensive. I would highlight China as a variable. Thus far, China, despite that profession of an un unbreakable bond of friendship between President Xi and President Putin uh, just, uh, just over a year ago before the, the Winter Olympics, China has been quite circumspect. Um, I'm sure China is looking at Ukraine, the Ukraine war, and learning lessons from it to ensure that when and if it decides to have a go at Taiwan, 
it doesn't make the mistakes that Russia has made. But at the same time, thus far, China has been pretty leery about providing military support in any direct form to Russia. And indeed, there were significant protestations from Beijing when it was accused as such last year. But I note a mention in the paper today that there is a real concern um, that China might decide to change that policy. And if it did change that policy and started providing military support to Russia, well, that could see a significant shift in Russian fortunes. And I think the fifth variable is the strategic leadership of particularly of, of two men, President Zelensky and President Biden, and their ability uh, to, sus to sustain and nurture the will, not only of their own people, but in President Biden's case, the alliance as well. And of course, President Zelensky has a significant part to play here. And as we saw with his recent visits to UK and to France, he is a master at uh, winning the battle of the narrative, and indeed more broadly, of course, I think the Ukrainian success in the overall Barrett battle of the narrative has been a remarkable feature of this campaign. But President Biden's leadership has been vital in hardening Western resolve and NATO resolve and coordinating that steady flow of aid to Ukraine. But this year, we can expect both men to be under greater pressure from Europe and from some in the US Congress to explore peaceful resolutions to the war. And meanwhile, President Putin, who you might say is the third variable under in terms of leadership, is playing for time, hoping that the West gradually tires of the war in 2023. Putin's strategy for Russia is to out-suffer the West. And we'll have to see where that goes. But it does ultimately depend on Western resolve holding. So what for the future? Can there be a peaceful resolution to this? I think we have to accept the reality that there won't be peace in Europe while Putin is in the Kremlin. Once again, in Europe, we've got a bloodstained tyrant prepared to do the unspeakable to his neighbors, democratic, peaceful neighbors. And the more blood that is shed, in a sense, the more blood is demanded. Two generations ago, our forebears had to do what needed to be done. But Hungary, of, all, of course, of all countries, knows the cost of that. Even if and when the guns fall silent in Ukraine, I think we have to make the assumption that there will be no fundamental leadership change or no fundamental change from Russia, whoever is in the Kremlin, and that Russia will use any opportunity given to it by a, uh, the guns falling silent to regroup, to rebuild, to retrain, and to have another go. Russia has arguably never been a nation state in the sense that France is a nation state or Spain since the Middle Ages, a nation state. Germany since reunification or since unification has been a nation state. Russia has been an empire throughout its history, and it has survived, in a sense, by expansion, by growing. Um, I think that is deep in the Russian DNA. And in a very real sense, I simplify, of course, but the story of Russia is a story of, of expansion, imperialist expansion, of overreaching itself, of collapsing or withdrawing, over, overstretching it, withdrawing, retrenching, and then starting all over again. I think we Europeans, and I say that in the broadest sense, face the prospect in the long term of a deeply traumatized state on Europe's boundaries with imperialist ambitions deep in its DNA. The so what for us, I think, as Europeans is that We'll have an angry, destructive, ultra-nationalist, revanchist state 
still feeling it has some sort of divine right to establish a third Rome, determined to rebuild a Russian empire, determined to remove Ukraine as, from the map as an independent country and potentially other post-Soviet republics, Georgia and Moldova particularly, right on NATO's border potentially for decades to come. So we have a generational challenge to deter Russia, which needs a transatlantic strategy for the non-NATO post-Soviet state. I think this requires a fundamental change of mindset in NATO. When, President, when Prime Minister Sunak says that NATO has to double down, as he did on Saturday at the Munich Security Conference, that doesn't only mean double down on provision of military support and other support to Ukraine to give Ukraine to do the tools it needs to do the job. It means doubling down on our own European defence and security. Only if we are prepared for the worst case can we genuinely offer a deterrence to Russia. And being prepared for the worst case means we have to be ready, and palatable as it may sound, for a, a war with Russia. And that means significant increases in defence spending, significant increase in, 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 in all the logistics and sustainability and the sinews that that requires. Looking at our own civil defence, looking at the way we conducted ourselves during the Cold War and perhaps looking, learning lessons from that for what is going to be, as I say, a generational challenge. I think we've got to think very carefully about security, long-term security for Ukraine when the, when the firing stops. My own view is that there's no alternative to Ukraine becoming part of NATO. Those promises uh, made at the Bucharest summit uh, the Budapest Summit, I beg your pardon, or the Budapest Memorandum in 1994 were utterly worthless. So there's got to be a bridging, say, because it's not going to happen yet and for a long time. There's got to be some means of bridging that gap. And ultimately, NATO's got to be prepared to put its money where its mouth is and be prepared to effectively deter, and that may mean putting troops in, on the ground in Ukraine one day and aircraft in the skies above. But in the context of this meeting, and I touched on it when I made a couple of remarks at the press conference earlier, as well as deterrence, dialogue is fundamental. We have to find ways to reach into Russian minds, reach into what exists in Russian civil society, in a similar way, perhaps, that happened at the, in the later stages of the Cold War whether it was through Samizdat Literature or Voice of America or Radio Free Europe or BBC World Service or other media means or Finnish television or German television beamed into East Germany, whatever, to try and get the message through to the Russian, to Russian people what is being done in their name. And perhaps culture and education has a really important part to play here. We all have a common heritage whether it's Tchaikovsky or Pushkin or Turgenev or Tolstoy. These are cultural icons for all of us. And I think we've got to be so careful about pulling down those icons because we have to build on what exists as a means of communication between us. And by way, if for our, a more interna international perspective, I think there's real messages here and massive implications for the international community. Not only the fact that a permanent member of the P5, of the, of the United Nations, and a signatory to the Charter of Human Rights is inflicting unspeakable suffering on a liberal, peaceful, democratic neighbor. But if Russia prevails, what does that say for the victory of, in terms of sending a message about the power of naked imperialism and might is right where does that leave values of international freedom, democracy, rule of law? Where does that leave the UN Charter of Human Rights? And of course, where does that leave that green light effectively to the use of nuclear saber rattling as a means of blackmail? And I haven't even begun to touch on the economic consequences of the war which are affecting, will affect every nation that depends on Ukrainian grain supplies or Russian grain supplies as well for its food. 
Jody touched on that line from Trotsky, you may not want war, but this war wants you. They're chilling words of Trotsky. But I was also, also like to remind you of that Roman maxim. If you want peace, prepare for war. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. We have a lot to think about. Um, this is a very balanced panel, actually, this afternoon, and I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Emil Brix, who is, uh, is with us on many of our events at IASC, and even previously with our Institute for Social and European Studies. Um, Emil Brix is an Austrian diplomat and historian, and he is a representative chairman of the Institute for the Danube Region in Central Europe. He also became the director of the Diplomatic Academy of um, Vienna, and he has been a friend and colleague for many years in our activity. So welcome again, Emil, and we we'll wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. I will stay here, if I may. I will stay here, if I may, for the panel discussion. Um, thank you for the invitation to come here. I do understand that we are in a city like uh, Westbrem because it's the cultural capital of Europe. Uh, whether it's the time of war in Ukraine or not, this would have been and will be the cultural capital of Europe for this year. Uh, so just to put things a little bit into perspective, I fully agree how urgent um, Sir uh, Richard described the situation that we are in. I fully agree that this is a, a global conflict between one way of living and the other way of living. And I fully agree that uh, the words that he, he used for, uh, for explaining uh, what's at stake. But at the same time, I have a few questions. The question is, is it really about how fast we, the West, can send weapons there and how fast the Russians can do this that will decide in the, on this war, that will decide the outcome of this war? Maybe. I hear more and more from military experts, I'm not one, that the West is sending weapons in a way that it is not challenging the Russians to use nuclear options. So the, for the Russians not to respond in a nuclear way, the West is hesitant to send too much too fast. Maybe this is true. I hear that more and more, not only from people who some, try to understand Mr. Putin, if you want to call it like that. If this is true, then one could say, Reasonable. Irreasonable. Or one could say, totally wrong. Uh, because it will continue the war, the time of the war, with all the losses that we have there. So, so one of the things is, we are in a situation of uncertainty, where, first of all, we do not know what the facts that we hear are true, and by whom we hear them, not even in our Western context. Uh, and we do not know if they are true, what the consequences would be. That's part of this sort of, not even in our ideas and narratives, we are resilient. And there seemed to be no need to be resilient. Because it was what the Germans called Friedensdividende. It was a time of peace after the end of the Cold War uh, and the unilateral moment in time. So why bother? Why bother with spending on the military? Why bother with making ideological decisions? Why bother with defending something like liberal democracy? Uh, what we learned in the meantime, that it's necessary. And so why I think this war, on the one hand, 
It's less important that uh, uh, some uh, military expert tell us, because there are so many wars on other parts of the world. But on the other hand, it's maybe more important, because it tells us that we need to be resilient in so, on so many grounds and fields. And there, I would say, there where culture comes in. Uh, Sir Richard said that the West did already win the battle of the, of the narratives. And I would love to agree that we won the battle of the, of the narrative about this war. But we won it only in the West. We didn't win it in Russia. And that's where, where we should have won it, actually. It's also important not to have too many people dissenting here. But it's about, about Russia. So we don't, shouldn't make the mistake that we, that we think that we won this battle of, 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 of narratives. And the second thing is, I always ask myself, how, how did it all come about? And there, I think it's, it, it's very clear. Uh, it came about because a few things still matter in how we look at the world and how we study the world. History still matters. And this would need a long discussion now on what history means, what the past means, what memory means, uh, how collective memory is used in politics, uh, how Mr. Putin and others um, uses uh, past uh, to create the, their idea of, of, of the nation and the state, actually. Uh, but it, let's call it history matters. That means that ideas matter. Even if there is not too much ideological thinking around the globe at the moment, but ideas matter. And secondly, geography matters, place matters. Uh, that's also very obvious. Small example, I am an Austrian. We always say, why should we be able to defend ourselves? We are an alpine country, small we are not a danger to anyone. We are surrounded by NATO countries, with the exception of Liechtenstein and Switzerland. And the Swiss are quite well in defending themselves. So why should we defend ourselves? Uh, and this is a, one of the, of, the, of, the, of the many arguments that you have when you talk about geography. Uh, and I do understand that, that uh, Sweden and Finland are in a different geographical position than Austria is at the moment. I do understand that they want to join NATO. But I would say understanding uh, where we are would also include to say that in a country like mine, in Austria, we need this discussion about security in spite of geography for many reasons, for, for good moral reasons that we should defend the right people and the right side but also in our own national interest. And by the way, there are people, I'm one of them who try to create a discussion about security issues in Austria. Uh, and uh, I have to say I don't understand, because I also like the solidarity that we are showing now in this, in this, uh, in this war with uh, Ukraine, but I just don't understand the position of the individual European countries. Austria is a neutral country. Hungary is a NATO country. Austria is giving more support to Ukraine than Hungary is giving to the Ukraine. So sometimes I don't understand what that means, actually, for our solidarity also, and the way we organize European security, I have to say. Um, but let's get back to geography matters. One of the things that... that this conflict shows us very much is that we all depend on our, on our way of supply lines on that, that means geography also. I was asked after there was the sabotage on the North Stream 2 pipeline, whether I 
have an idea who is responsible. And you know all these uh, hypotheses, it might have been the Americans we heard recently, it might have been the British we heard. Um, some people say it, those who have most interest is certainly uh, those who don't want that Europe gets oil and, and gas from, from Russia. Uh, but I have to say, it, to me, it sounds very obvious that it was the Russians. That it was the Russians and nobody else. Uh, but in our, my context, it means, you see, geography matters here again. And it does make sense that we discuss now suddenly that whether there are cables under the water connecting Norway to, to Europe or Europe to the US or wherever it is, how important this has become. This war is a reminder, and I think that's, that's one of the few positive things that we have to look into connectivity, supply lines much more than we, than we used to. Actually, we Central Europeans always talked about connectivity, and we called it plurality, diversity, and things like that, but we related it actually to the development of ideas. The creativity of Vienna around 1900 and things like that, or Budapest around 1900. But here it's about connecting it also to the, the to the real connectivity of pipelines, and energy was mentioned. Uh, so I think what we what we what we see in this in in this war, and I'm not an expert on scenarios of how to end this war. What I see there is that it is important to discuss already now what the consequences will be. And, and for sure, the consequences uh, will be, uh, do we have ways to explain narratives better? Do we have ways to differentiate between facts and fiction better? Uh, do we have ways to well, do something which I, which I, I wonder whether it's, it's a good idea, uh, to draw red lines? You see, I, I wonder always, I have learned as a historian, but even, even as a, in, in school, red lines are lines we draw that the opponent is not crossing them. Now we are suddenly discussing in the West red lines that we are doing ourselves, that we should not cross. There's something wrong. Or maybe it's all red lines everywhere. So there are all, there are all these things that we could learn from, uh, from uh, what's, what, what is maybe the consequence. Uh, and then... I shouldn't pray, talk for too long. And in, in, in basically, I'm also a, a hawk like you, if, if I'm allowed to say so. And I'm for deterrence. And I'm for knowing what, what's, what's white and what's black. But what about these almost already one million Germans signing a petition of peace now, suddenly, a manifesto of peace now? What should we do with them? Um, and at the same time, understanding that the political leaders in Germany, but Austria is a similar case, are very strong on saying how we have to defend our system against the Russian aggression. Uh, I think what we have to, but what we have to do is really to to, to look for the uh, to. For the argumentation, we need uh, this dialogue within our societies more than than we have it at the moment, um, and because they will not go away. And I tell you the story in 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 my country in Austria. In the public discussion, you don't have 
anyone really uh, who defends the Russian aggression. But under the surface, you have millions almost of people who say, mm, wait and see. First of all, maybe we can profit after the war is over. Secondly, well, they are all nasty people, these politicians, anyhow, and these military leaders. So there's not much difference. They are all guilty. Uh, and thirdly, we Central Europeans are in an even worse situation because we always said we have a right to have a culture which has some sort of linkage to Russia, but also a linkage to Shakespeare. Uh, so where are we now in Central Europe? Are we still allowed to do this? And when are we now? Should we be quiet now and not, 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 talk, not talk about that there is something like a Central European culture? Maybe, yeah, we are more quiet than we used to be. But, uh, but, but I think so. We shouldn't allow here that this is the case because then it turns into a situation which we have now that you have within the European discussion, even in Central Europe countries like Poland, which is very outspoken and very one, much on, on defending the European values, uh, and Hungary, where, such, where the situation is different to be not so outspoken. Well, or Slovakia might be similar sooner or later. Or Austria, where officially Austria is very strong, but under the surface things look different. So I would finish here actually in saying that uh, the most possible scenario for, the, for after this war is, as I see it, that we will have to create a European security architecture with Russia outside, with Russia via the other. Um, uh, and I hope that this is peaceful coexistence then between us and Russia. I hope this is a real cold war, not worse. Uh, I don't see a chance that we can integrate Russia in the, in the nearer or medium future into such a system. Uh, and I would include uh, also human security issues, not <laughs> only security in the hard, hard terms. So, uh, and this is where I think we diplomats come into play again uh, to formulate this, uh, this uh, European security architecture. Uh, and to be frank, the structures, the multilateral structures that we have at the moment needs to be reformed. It can't be that the P5 have, have among themselves the veto power to discuss such fundamental issues of global, of global concern uh, <laughs> if uh, one of them is against them. So there must be the reform there. It can't be that we have an organization for security and cooperation in Europe which cannot save security and cooperation in Europe. So why don't we have it? Um, uh, so we need a, a new Helsinki. We need a new moment to get together to discuss the European architecture again. Unfortunately, this time without Russia. And I have to say, <laughs> It's, I'm almost not daring to say this. I would have hoped also without the US and Canada. <laughs> a real European security conference. But at the moment, I'm also a transatlanticist. Have to be. We'll see in the future what's necessary. But uh, I, I think I talked already for too long and told you too much about what I think politically. But let me, let me uh, finish with my experience when I arrived in winter 2015 in Moscow. I arrived on the 19th of January 2015 on Domodedevo airport and was driven to the city center. The first thing I saw, I was with my wife Elizabeth, she was, she was here as well. The first thing we saw was actually 
half naked men and women, old men and women, jumping into the cold water between the airport in Domedilivo uh, and the city center of Moscow. Why did they do this? Most of you will know, because it is a tradition, a Russian tradition, to jump into the cold water on the 19th of, um, uh, of, of January. Uh, and uh, if you analyze this, it's an act of redemption. Redemption. To get rid of your sins. That, was the idea, that is the idea of doing this. And then I, we arrived. We stayed for, for, for some weeks in a hotel near the Kremlin, on the other side of the, of the river. And one of the first things that we experienced there was the death of the most prominent opposition person in Moscow, Boris Nemtsov, who was killed about less than 100 meters from the bed where I slept in. And I realized only next day morning, on a Saturday. Why am I mentioning these two things? Just to say that maybe, maybe it's true. It's a different civilization. Maybe it's true. Um, but these sort of things, both, that we are looking for acts of redemption, we do everywhere, a around the globe, looking for acts of redemption. Not all of us are jumping into cold water. Uh, and maybe killing dissident voices, also doing something that we do everywhere. So I would not accept to say that Russia is a, is a, is a totally different civilization. I would say you have a political regime there that wants to, us to believe that this is a different civilization. And we should not accept that this is the case. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emil. You brought an even more complexity and depth to, to I hope, the, the consequent discussion that we're going to have. I think that one of the questions I hope that's brought up in the discussions, Professor Sirlici, is who benefits from uh, an extended war? Who benefits from you know, continued destruction, human suffering, and then the rebuilding of Ukraine? I'd, I'd like to know kind of what the material interests are also behind um, a, a protracted war in Europe. Um, OK, Sean Cleary, are you here? Is Sean online? I am indeed. I can't see you. There you are. OK. Hello, Sean. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's good to see you. Um, let me introduce our next speaker to you. Sean Cleary um, is the chairman of Strategic Concepts Limited. He's the managing director of the Center for Advanced Governance and founder and executive chair of the Future World Foundation. Importantly, he is also a member of the IASC International, International Board. And you know, Sean, previously we've had um, we've had uh, presentations with, from military expertise, from diplomatic expertise, and when I try to categorize you, I just thought you were an omnivore. You know, you can pretty much <laughs> cover all fields. So I'm, I'm curious, and I will be surprised with what you come up with today. So welcome. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Dirty. And I promise not to eat anyone. <laughs> so at least that part of being an omnivore won't be part of what I do. I'm also going to dispense with slides. There are is a set, Ivana has it, and students are more than welcome to have a look at those in greater depth. But I think in the interests of time, it makes sense to try in one sense to characterize the way in which one sees the situation, but also in part uh, to respond to the absolutely splendid uh, presentations that frankly, all of you, including you, Jody, have made up to this point in time. I remember Kay Ordick from your earlier writings, and I think it is highly applicable um, at this point in time. Um, but I also want to celebrate, in a certain sense, both the linear directness 
that Sir Richard offered in offering a military perspective on the present situation. Because if one doesn't understand the challenges of the battlefield, if one doesn't understand the strategic context within which the struggle is being fought, then by definition, we will make horrendous mistakes in the way in which we manage it. That said, as the focus of this discussion, as I understand it, is on in part structuring for a subsequent peace after the event, and as the frame that we're using for discussion is that of complexity, I would argue that the problem that we have is that that specific strategic focus on what is necessary to win the war undercuts the frame that we have to address when we ask what will the future peace look like. And Emil, I think, uh, introduced a very important idea into the midst of that, the idea of a European security architecture that excluded Russia. I, I must honestly say it's the first time I've heard that expressed in as simple terms. Carl Bildt, right at the beginning, said something rather like Sir Richard this afternoon, which is that peace without Putin, or peace with Putin, I'm sorry, is perhaps impossible. But arguing that Russia cannot be part of a future security architecture is a remarkable further step. Let me offer a few thoughts to shape my own perspective. I think the terrifying thing about what we've seen over the last now nearly 12 months since the 24th of February is that firstly, Putin violated Article 2 of the UN Charter, as everyone knows. He violated at least four principles of peremptory international law, those that we think of as being US cogens. He violated rules of humanitarian and human rights law at scale, and the ICC, I am sure, will find that Russian troops have committed crimes against humanity of various sorts within the framework of their activity. It's very difficult to argue that the scale of shelling against civilian infrastructure that has been undertaken is not not only prima facie, but self-evidently are such a crime against humanity. That said, however, the truth is, and I think that's where Sir Richard was starting, one, the West failed to deter this. And a failure of deterrence is a frightening concept in nuclear age. Secondly, the West did not execute its responsibility to protect in terms of well-established United Nations principles since 2004. And if one looks at all of the language, both private and public, around that decision, it was for fear that Mr. Putin might use his nuclear arsenal. That creates a situation where, in effect, we have no instruments of deterrence. And in the context of Mr. Putin's bluster, which Mr. Medvedev has perhaps exceeded, it is difficult to know where the line is between where we are at present and where we would go to before an act of desperation emerged in Moscow. I have no technical view on it, so I'm going to leave it there. But there's a larger question, I think, about all of this. We are still speaking as though we can control the outcome. And one of the most fundamental insights out of an understanding of the complexity of the systems that we are a part of is that the illusion of control is precisely what usually leads us into catastrophe. It was the illusion that we could determine to put in with everything that we have known since at least his speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, his action vis-a-vis -vis Georgia in 2008, his actions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine in 2014, 
and innumerable actions on a smaller scale since then, including in Syria in the aftermath of the notional red line in respect of chemical weapons not, in fact, being maintained by the West. Despite all of that, we seemed to continue to believe that deterrence was possible, and we did not act so as to exercise our responsibility to protect. More difficult, I think, if one focuses on the idea of excluding Russia for a greater or a shorter period of time from the European security architecture, is what we have done vis-a-vis -vis China in the same period. Because the binary distinction between techno-democracies and techno-autocracies, despite the fact that Mr. Xi, quite frankly, was horrified when Putin went in on the 24th of February, precisely because non-violation of the territorial integrity of sovereign states is a central pillar of both the national security and foreign policy of the People's Republic of China. And despite the fact that numerable, innumerable statements, there are at least nine, and I think we're going to hear another one on the 24th of February from Wang Yi, probably, but it may be from Xi, Despite the fact that there are at least nine statements to date where the Chinese have made very clear that the sovereign integrity of national borders is a principle that they hold dear, we have chosen to underutilize China in respect of grappling with Putin. I think we're at the point now where that is about to happen, but quite frankly, surveillance balloons and similar things being downed off the coast of South Carolina after having traversed the continental United States seemed in terms of the exchange in Munich between Blinken and Wang Yi to have exacerbated the problem rather than having resolved it. One can only hope that whether it is Wang Yi's speech or Xi's speech on the 24th will bring back the same sort of sobriety that we saw after the meeting between Biden and Xi in Bali. But then we have to ask ourselves outside of all this, we have to ask ourselves, what is the world we wish to create? Yes, we need fundamentally to restructure the global architecture. No, quite frankly, we do not have the financial resources to be able to divert the sort of scale of investment into military preparedness that would be the natural consequence of fighting an extended war for a decade or longer. The contraction in the global economy, the effects in respect of energy costs and food costs, and the implications in respect of inflation are not tolerable even in the medium term. We are sitting with at least 450 billion costs associated with the reconstruction of Ukraine at present. Assuming that the war continues for another 12 months, by definition, those numbers will increase highly significantly and the resources of the world to be able to address them are going to decline. And the impacts for less developed countries, in particularly, and particularly those that have no fiscal space whatever, is going to be quite devastating during that period. The West will not hold the rest on side if it pursues such a strategy. So the complexity of the moment that we face requires us to do two things. One is avoid sleepwalking into war. And by that, I mean with China. I don't think Mr. Chi wishes to invade Taiwan. He wishes to incorporate Taiwan unquestionably. It's part of the constitution of the People's Republic of China. And one of the things that the Chinese have spent most time on since Bali has been getting every US spokesman that has engaged with them to repeat Washington's commitment to the one China policy and strategic ambiguity. But I do think that as happens in every human relationship, when things go sour, when one is perceived to be insulting the other by the other, the other loses tolerance. 
and an escalation into conflict quite often occurs without any intention for that to occur. Sir Richard mentioned the battlefields of the First World War. It's worth remembering that no single power after a Serbian nationalist assassinated an Austrian Grand Duke wished to have a world war in 1914. But in four months, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the French, the Germans, and even the British eventually were at war. And that war lasted four years and cost tens of millions of lives. Miscalculation is a frightening thing. And we have to think very carefully about what the plans are for the day after and how we will go about constructing an order that enables us to be able to survive together within the framework of essential norms, essential rules of international law, essential principles of conduct, which have been so egregiously violated in the present circumstance. I leave it there until the discussion. Thank you so much, Sean. I hope you can stay with us a little bit longer for some discussion and questions. Um, we are going to be a bit spontaneous right now. I would like to make, a, to make a short change in the program, and I would like to ask the Honorable Ambassador from Croatia to come and give a few comments. Thank you very much for this opportunity and, and congratulations for this for this year's get together. Uh, it's a very important international gathering, and I find it uh, quite interesting f from year to year. And and uh, Ferenc Professor Mislavitz is is the guilty one for for inventing all of the things on the board. Um, if you look at this sketch, and I was looking for it for a couple of hours. I think we know, or we are most aware of the resilience. We know already about vulnerability and, and the opposites. And uh, age of uncertainty, we accomplished Galbraith plus uh, uh, growth and, and, and the things. OK, we are moving around the peace. Uh, culture, education, it was tackled. Okay, here are the sponsors or agents. Uh, what, what do we lack from the uh, first page that was here uh, during the press conference? It is uh, the media, meaning communication. Uh, some of you were talking already about the importance of communication. And this is something that we really do, do lack in current age of uncertainty. Uh, the dialogue that was repeatedly mentioned, it's also extremely important. It is not only the dialogue within the countries, the regions, the cities, municipalities, whatever the level is, or nations, or in Central Europe, but it is the, the global, international dialogue. That is what we do lack. And hopefully, from time to time, we have uh, places like this. Uh, not to continue with the same, I would say, even discourse that was, that was opened here, in, particularly in the last, two, two, uh, last three uh, uh, um, uh, contributions from Sir Richard to... to uh, I, would, I would like to share with you some of my thoughts regarding what Croatia does. And maybe this is a, a, a way for, for somehow moving from, from this, this uh, fatigue of terrible aggression, uh, on, terrible ongoing war, and all this said data regarding today and tomorrow, and how to handle with that. But I would like to share with you some of my thoughts of what Croatia did in the last couple of months, <laughs> having in mind all the, the uh, uh, um, 
sympathy and, and very concrete support to Ukraine uh, without any doubts, uh, under the, the, the average ratio, I would say. But, but to speak about some, some other things that we did, that is maybe the way out to re-establish uh, the values and the worthiness of, of European values for each and every one. In these sad times of multiple crises, I'd like to sh share with you some, some, some uh, or few thoughts about uh, recent Croatian experience, uh, which contributes both internally and externally, namely to Croatia's political uh, and economic substance, but also to the EU unity. Notwithstanding the importance of culture and education, let me add something that is obviously a part of today's Europe and its culture although being based upon, singly upon economy. Basically, it does with entering and being a part of the Euro Eurozone and the Schengen system. First, it makes Croatia more resilient and even more trusted and reliable international partner. Secondly, positive signs go not only towards tourism as a forerunner of Croatia's national economy, but throughout the national economic system and everyday life of people. And thirdly and foremost, as a fully integrated EU and NATO member state, it shows a clear sign of security and predi predictability for foreigners, being visitors, investors, whatever. Being a small and open economy, and the most of European economies are such, not France and Germany, but or Italy or Spain, but being a small and open economy, entering the Eurozone, Croatia gains an added value when it comes to export-oriented economy with the single market. This offers then market-level playing field within the EU for Croatian enterprises, making them even more eligible for competition and functioning. So, already in the short run, it seems that accomplishing these high or highest integration standards make Croatia's economy stronger and less vulnerable to the outside effects of turbulent demand and supply. The, uh, the internal economic balance and growth moves from the possible effects of EU sanctions to the core structural issues and changes within national economy. So to make the long story short, further economic and political opening has proved once again to be the right path for achieving a win-win situation, at least internally, but also externally. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Here I would. Thank you so much. Um, I think that one thing that uh, maybe we've forgotten because we are all too short-sighted is the fact that we have had a devastating wars in our neighborhood um, since 1989. And there's a wealth of experience in the populations on how to maintain resilience and how to rebuild after that kind of devastation. So I think we need to take advantage of our neighbors' knowledge and experience when we look forward to see, um, to look at scenarios for the future in Ukraine as well. So first of all, I would like to thank all the contributors of this morning session. They set the stage in a most fascinating way. We still have one contribution to make uh, by Professor uh, Mislivas, but let me just set the tone of the coming session, which we have to finish by four o'clock, by, 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 by way of introduction, if I may say. Uh, I served uh, more than 25 years uh, uh, in UNESCO, uh, so I'm genetically re-engineered. Uh, by, uh, by UNESCO. So let me just start with the very first sentence of UNESCO's constitution, which was written by an American poet, Archibald MacLeish, way back in 1945. 
Professor Eta has stolen my thunder, but nevertheless I repeat it because there are some messages that perhaps would set the stage uh, for the um, discussion that is to follow. So let me just start by saying UNESCO Constitution, sentence number one. Since wars begin in the minds of man, it is the minds of man that the defenses of peace must be constructed. The great and terrible war, which has now ended, was a war made possible by the denial of the democratic principles of the dignity, equality, and mutual respect of man, and by the propagation in their place through ignorance and prejudice of the doctrine of the inequality of man and races. Therefore, UNESCO's goal is to contribute to peace and security by promoting collaboration among, among the nations through education, science, and culture in order to further universal respect for justice, for the rule of law, and for the human rights and fundamental, fundamental freedoms. The rest of the Constitution is a pretty boring administrative you know, set of uh, regulations which I never read, and that's the reason why I survived UNESCO for 25 years. But these sentences uh, are extremely important for our discussion uh, uh, this afternoon, where our, the purpose of this afternoon session is to find alternative scenarios and exploring political, economic, ecological, and cultural consequences of a conflict. Now, let me... Uh, Invite to the uh, to the to the stage, uh, Professor uh, Ferenc uh, Mislivets, a UNESCO chair, a director general of the I Ask, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Kursag, the architect of, of of this meeting, the architect of I Ask, and the architect of many other things, and hope that he will be also an architect of peace in Ukraine. So come over here. I don't know what is the how to how to manipulate this. Push the top button. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Andras, um, and 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 um, thank you, Jody, accepting that I, I skipped my lecture and now I give you a short version of it. I'm not showing all of the slides I, I was preparing with, um, but but it's true. I, I actually wanted to be an architect. Yes, so I, I probably it was a very very strong. Sorry to talk about myself, but the very strong um, uh, obsession almost. I went to school to study mathematics and physics, so the, the gymnasium. The very last minute, I changed my mind. I don't give you the details why. That, that is good for architecture, right? Yeah, but I it 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 it, it, <laughs> it rem, no I remain it was a suppressed aborted architect. So this is why I'm doing what I'm doing in Kursk. So, okay, I'm not sure that I can be alone, and I'm not alone, the architect of what, what is, I ask, the fantastic, fantastic friends and colleagues, um, and we have started it much before I ask existed, as I, I told you, so this is like a three decades, three, or more than 35 years uh, process, which is not the topic of, of today's lecture, but it's, it's, it's good to mention that what you, um, that you experience here, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a long, long term work, desire, attempt, aspiration to bring people together, exchange views and listening to each other. And that's, that has become, that's true, more important in my understanding than anything else. That we can dig deep in our disciplines and find new facts and new, new methods, etc., in physics, mathematics, sociology or economics, but to, 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 to dialogue, uh, to exchange views and to listen, especially when we do it, not agree with each other. And to learn, that is probably, and very fast, we do this very fast, we don't have time. I just gave an interview to one of the Hungarian um, uh, um, media agency, and uh, after like 15 years, we started to talk about the crises, interwoven, multi-layered, um, hydra-headed crises, which the media completely ignored. They said, the mainstream, Hungarian liberal media, said, well, this is just a 89, 2002, that is just only, um, yeah, one of those crises, and the business as usual is coming back. So there's a lagging behind 
and now this part of my message here, because we don't, do not know how to communicate, we do not know how to communicate, and there is very little exchange between those who should exchange their views. And I think all of us in university business, in academia, in journalism, politics, diplomacy are responsible for that. And this war is, I think, like a lachmus test. It shows how important, honest, and deep communication is. So I, I produced a paper which I think everyone received, and that is um, the attempt to, to write a second part of it, to be sanctioning the future. And I changed the title with new chapters of war, peace, and the violence in the 21st century. Because we did not t talk especially um, about violence. Um, Sir Richard mentioned that, and, and that is true. He actually predicted the future. This rarely happens. It with this clarity in his book written in 2016, he exactly described uh, the model of, of intervention, etc., the Russian aggression. <clears throat> and, and as also he very well describes, his um, colleagues, bosses, etc., within NATO and also in, in British politics, did not, did not listen. In fact, they, he, they wanted to punish him. And this, you, you should read the, the, <laughs> uh, the introduction of the book um, because he just told them the truth. And this is what we experience in social sciences, um, in, in the academia. But you come with, uh, with, a, with a new insight, a new idea. They say that is, this is rubbish. That's ideology. That's not going to happen. And so in our, in our Western world, I think we are creating the obstacles of understanding complexities ourselves, yeah? With our institutions, which are uh, petrified and old-fashioned, and, and of course create for those who work there a certain safety, uh, security, if you want, financially, or, or giving some prestige, but we are blocking each other from understanding a present and the future, which is getting incredibly and, and increasingly complex. So now um, I should go somewhere else to see. It was the level of violence. Yeah, you could predict the war. And Russia did what you have described. And e even the, this, uh, you remember, at the beginning of the war, we were afraid in Europe that, um, that the Baltics will be occupied. And Ukraine is just um, a little beginning. That was the, the, yes, you could predict it, but the amount and the brutality of violence was not predictable. And that is one of my, I don't know, messages, but uh, conclusions that <clears throat> agreeing with Hannah Arendt, violence, when it starts uh, and it takes a form of a, <clears throat> social um, game, it's not predictable. Okay, so what is the, the, the problem here is that there were a lot of predictions and, and govern, governance and governments did not listen. Um, we don't have time to discuss it. Not only about the war, about COVID, about climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, yes. Maps, yes. Geography, yes, it does count. Um, <clears throat> you can see how, how, how NATO uh, and Russia looked before and after 91. And <clears throat> we just discussed it with my colleagues um, during the break. It, there are two different things. is to understand the motivation, the aspirations of your counterpart. Try to understand, use your intuition and sensitivity, etc. But does not mean that you agree or you accept that. And it was predictable, and it was it came out very well from um, uh, from um, Richard Sheriff's talk that it was predictable that the Russians are going to react. And Putin said so in 2008 that he actually talked about a red line. And NATO, as led by Americans, did not care and for that we need more research, why and how it happened. There was a famous NATO meeting where Putin was present. Yeah? <clears throat> so one thing is that we do not agree with the culture of violence, the culture of, I don't know, of doing politics um, as it happens in the Russian Empire. This is not really our culture. Yeah? 
that, that, that if it is predictable, that if you do things which they take provocation, then the consequent, consequence might be war and bloodshed, that should have been taken more seriously. Um, yes, I, I have to skip because um, it's not, there's no time for that. Um, yes. Um, the unpredictability of violence. Yes, we are an, a, about, about a, around the beginning of the, the neoliberal world order, but it still exists. It still has a lot of institutions, and especially the mainstream media um, and, and, and other institutions, the, the less and less useful international organizations. Yes, UN was mentioned, UNESCO was mentioned, other security, um, ge uh, regional security institutions, they are completely paralyzed. They can't do anything. Guterres, the, the general secretary of, of UN, every second week says, oh, terrible, we are heading towards more and more danger. The, the world is becoming more and more dangerous. This is where are the blue helmets. There is any, any suggestion from the UN side for any real solution? Nothing. That is, a, that is an expression of a deep crisis. And that we do not talk about it. We pretend, we, in the Western world at least, as if this, these institutions would function. They're not. They are not functioning. Okay, so in, in, as a consequence, you know, probably you heard this many times here from, from us, and I ask, divided societies, increasing polarization, look at United States, look at Great Britain. It's not um, United Kingdom, this United Kingdom. is United Nations is this United Nations. So this is what I told you in my preface, in my introduction, that the, the, the concepts we use are turning against themselves. They are undermined. I mean, they, they are, the content is lost, and, and, and it bec becomes negative. Um, yes. The final question, which... Nobody knows the answer for how to make peace and who can guarantee a new peace order. Yeah, well, there were some 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 politicians, statesmen who 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 raised their hands. Erdogan, for sure, he would never we never do that after this tragedy in Turkey, and but others too. Yeah, I don't want to mention too many names. Who? Yeah, that were some people, um, politicians in Hungary as well. Um, people, one million Germans, but peace now, yes. Yeah? So if, if there would be a ceasefire, I mean, sure, it would counter you. Who would guarantee peace? Oh. Okay, look, this is a very telling uh, photo of three people. Um, Richard. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, but if we have Putin, look at the, the difference in, in faces. Um, it was Gorbachev was only, you know, I mean, he was until '91. He was the first man of the Soviet Union, and and and, and then you, you know, and and he offered the word, the Western word, cooperation. And there were great European politicians, Mitterrand and Kohl, and even Americans who agreed. I mean, that was a general agreement. You might say today, oh, it was illusion. Uh, it was not supported by by arms, by armies, but there was an agreement and Gorbachev did something and Mr. Putin would not exist with, uh, uh, without Gorbachev. So there was a very interesting Shakespearean moment. Someone criticized him that he did not go to the funeral. He did, alone a day before. And there was a very famous photo of Gorbachev standing alone with the coffin of Gorbachev and watching him with a, a bouquet of flower, flowers. The, he wouldn't exist without and Viktor Orban, either, either. I mean, our politicians, um, thanks to their existence, because Gorbachev created a, a global situation, disarmament, etc., when it was possible for us in Eastern Central Europe to, to, to do what we did, yeah, peaceful, velvet revolutions, whatever it was. Uh, <clears throat> okay, um, there's a very interesting point, and, and it's, it, 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 it directs to our, our discussion. How many Russia exists? There was a... <clears throat> 10, 12 years ago, Natalia Zubarovic, an interesting um, mind and sociologist and geographer, who, who talked about four different kinds of Russia. Maybe we have here in the room 
uh, our colleagues and friends from Russia who could, who could tell us more in details. So uh, uh, maybe one tenth, 15 percent of Russian population, yeah, our colleagues, friends in academia, etc., are like us. There's no difference in thinking, maybe a little bit in culture, but I don't think so. But those are either gone or are silenced or in prison, etc. So there is a very European, very Western. And then there are um, a, a layer of, of Russian society. Then the blue collar workers, and then more people who are more manipulable. But, but, but people are manipulable, are manipulated almost all over the world, not only in Russia. Um, <clears throat> so it's very dangerous to create uh, us against them. It is dangerous for ourselves, it's dangerous for the potential of the peace. You can say, yeah, go on, go on, come here. Uh, I, I never, uh, so my name is Hanyata Pavlovich, I'm one of the speakers of this conference and I'm ask, I ask researcher, very proud of it. Um, here, I never wrote that paper because I had too many things to do, <laughs> but uh, I would add one and probably the most important fifth Russia here, and that is the Kremlin. When we talk about Russia, we usually talk exactly about that one Russia. And all of these four Russias are usually overseen. So they're not really in the, in the discourse. And thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. Let's go on. Um, yes. Um, that the miscalculation of Putin was discussed already. We can skip that. There's a cartoon. I skipped all the cartoons because there's nothing to laugh about. But this is not a cartoon, this is quite telling. It's true, without US and NATO, this war could not be waged. But if there's a paradox with US and NATO, it seems to me that this war cannot be won either. That's the paradox, yeah? Because we cannot go too far. They cannot use F-16 and, and the tanks, so yeah, giving the, the tanks and not to give them, the, because we want to avoid nuclear war. But that's what Putin knows. I'm coming back to this at the end. Yeah, here is something that, um, again, it's too much to read, but Shank Liri told me, I wasn't aware of this, there was a chance if we had this heroic West who wants to you know, protect and defend, in March, very soon after the war broke out, to use the, the method of no-fly zone. Some people, maybe, maybe Richard would, um, wouldn't agree with me, or uh, <clears throat> there was a chance that, that the UN, not the, um, uh, the, the General Assembly, um, not the Security Council, would kind of support um, Ukraine's effort to create a no-fly zone above Ukraine. That could have stopped the escalation of war. I'm asking rather than stating this, um, that would have caused probably life. Yeah, yeah. American, um, uh, American uh, pilots, etc. But that could have been stop the war at the very beginning. Do, do, do you don't agree? Okay, no. Okay. Well, that's that's one 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 illusion less. Okay, one illusion less. Go further. Um, these are three scenarios uh, of our Russian colleague and friend Andrei Kortunov, who is leading uh, an, a, a, a well-known um, NGO. Um, think tank in Moscow, the Russian International Affairs Council, uh, RIAC. He says that these three scenarios are plausible. Um, the victory of liberal hegemony uh, looks like a far away possibility today to me. No winner scenario, that's quite realistic. Uh, the military conflict ends uh, indecisively. The West is forced to compromise with China, and this leads to a reform of the global order. Mm -mm. Uh, and the third one is still a danger, I think, the incessant conflict scenario. I mean, chaos and more violence and more war. Um, we should probably discuss it. Um, here is a promise. Again, it's waiting, but it, when I read it first, um, last, um, last October, I was a little, little, how to say, I was more hopeful than I'm today. Um, the, 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 the chance for a new European construction. The European construction was halted. 
after the East West, the Eastern enlargement, um, there was no real understanding between the newcomers, East Central Europeans, and the Western part of, 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 of the European Union. And it seems that, that there was a wake-up call and some positive reactions to create a European political community. The first meeting happened already with 44 countries. We don't have a political community. And this is why we have the American tutelage in, in NATO altogether, yeah? This is why we do not have a European, why don't we have a European army? If you add all the armies, the, 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 the members, yeah, the, the number of soldiers, the tanks, etc., all together, if you could integrate it, it would be much more powerful than any other armies in the world. But we don't have it. Why? Good question. We can discuss it. Okay, so th that was what Borrell said in uh, October 6th, and the next meeting, the second meeting will be in Moldova, <coughs> if it happens, June 1st. Good luck for us. This is... Um, maybe maybe um, Emil can add, add something to this if it is plausible or not. Um, then other um, good moment was when I read um, Olaf Scholz's um, <coughs> speech at Prague University. He spoke about the same, and um, that, that Germany is ready for a leading military role to ensure Europe's security. Question mark. I do not know, and I don't see it. I, I, maybe they consider. Maybe. But I think that the German trauma uh, of after the Second World War is too is it, it went too deep, and and if you see German politicians discussing the issues with Zelensky, you see that they are tortured. They cannot they, they cannot say. I mean, and Putin knows this very well. This he says that tanks. Yeah, again, he's telling hundred million people who only watch one channel. Here you again, we have the Nazis coming back with the same tanks. We have to defend our motherland. That was, again, predictable. So go further very quickly. Um, yeah, I talked to you. I mentioned the common European army. And here is the nuclear threat. And uh, <laughs> I'm the, the, the number of warheads and the strengths. Unfortunately, um, the non-Western capacity is greater, bigger than the Western one. If, if you say that India and Pakistan is kind of um, swinging states. And yes, and here I understand that the um, that United States and Western Europe um, is, are very cautious and, and are afraid to provoke um, Putin and the Russian army too much. And, but where is the limit? And this is a, how to say it, a situation when Putin can blackmail the Western world. And he does. So that's that's my that's the end of my. Um, uh, um, here it is. Um, the, the citations with the tanks. Oh, that's a good that's a good cartoon. Uh, the, a lot of yes, yes, we, yes, we give them. Yeah, comes uh, out as a no. And um, that is the question: I, Is there a third way? Tertium non datur or tertium datur? This is um, this is which we probably should discuss. Um, if you read um, the literature, um, you don't get very um, optimistic. Ken Follett just finished the novel, Never, which messages that um, we have a, a, a new um, American um, president, a lady who is in the middle of the row, he's conservative, but not like Trump. He, she wants peace, and, and, and that her life mission is to avoid with every means nuclear war. And it's described very, in a very smart way at the end, in a bunker or wherever she is hiding, she has to push the button. And um, the conclusion is, from Hannah Arendt, is this just uh, a couple of questions to you and for the discussion. Um, why is violence breaking out? Why is warfare still with us in the nuclear age when we know that the nuclear war is not a possibility. A secret death wish of humans or an irrepressible instinct of aggression or, that's an under-discussed question, the economic and social danger inherent in disarmament, the military-industrial complex's interest, or because there is no final arbiter in international affairs. That he, Putin does it because he can do it. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you.
please join us at the table here. Uh, there, there is a, according to some, a, a Danish proverb, others are saying that this is a statement due to Niels Bohr, the nuclear physicist who said once that forecasting is a difficult thing, particularly if it concerns the future. Now that's, that's what we are trying to do uh, this afternoon, or rather look into the various scenarios that Professor Mislivets was alluding to. But before I do that, I would like to state loud and clear, and I cannot emphasize it enough, that Russian culture and uh, imperialistic Russian policies and propaganda are two entirely different things. Linking them is a gross mistake. For instance, I got socialized on Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Stravinsky, Kolmogorov, and all the eggheads, uh, the Russian uh, school of, of, of physics. Likewise, when it comes to Ukraine, I got socialized on the Vityab school of art, Chagall, or, or Kazimir Smalevich. Uh, the modernity in terms of culture was born there in both, both places. And I think one, one, one has to be very clear about that one. And another statement just to set the, the tone right. Last Saturday, two days ago, I listened carefully to a major speech of a leading Hungarian political figure uh, in his uh, State of the Country address. That politician mentioned that, I quote, Hungary acknowledges that Ukraine is protecting her own sovereignty. However, it would not be morally appropriate to prefer the interest of Ukraine over those of Hungary. This was a public speech, end of quote. Not even for a short while, until the war is over, accepting genocide, what is happening there, big scale, mass killings, rape, children being killed. This is entirely immoral. Person, I believe that this approach, what I was uh, quoting, is deeply immoral as well. Even if it is covered by pseudo-Christianity, it's morally wrong. So what I would suggest that perhaps this is an angle we ought to cover next to the uh, strategical uh, approaches. How can we bring in morale to the understanding of people? Because that basically is uh, UNESCO's mission. And I believe that clear thinking on, a, on the basis of morale is more important than politics, definitely. Anything is more important than politics, or military, uh, for, 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 for that matter. I believe we all agree that the Ukrainian war is a huge moral crisis for Europe and for the whole world. That is why we cannot say, oh, this is none of my business. I want to be left out. <laughs> we are all involved up to our neck. And the next generation can even be more involved simply by being call, uh, killed by a nuke. So what could and should we as supposedly intellectuals do through culture, education, and science in order to mitigate the impact of this horrific war which is in the neighborhood. Nine million Ukrainians already left the country. This is no small order. And then the, 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 the murderous uh, uh, president is, uh, is saying that we're going to nuke the Americans if they don't behave. So these are the, these are the, 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 the things that I think uh, we have to, we have to uh, discuss. What is your view on this? Uh, I know it's a $60,000 question, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring in uh, this dimension of the morality, because that's what UNESCO is all about. You know, therefore, I believe personally that UNESCO is the most important organization of the United Nations system, uh, because it wants to preserve peace through culture 
education and science. So how do you think that the debate can be given a, a, a spin? You would like to say? Yeah. Well, Come here, you are a speaker. If you you has an answer, then go on. I just wanted to bring in another related aspect. Um, can you repeat that Archibald um, McLeish quote to me? Can you repeat the, the first, first one or the last one? The first one you All said. right, okay. What it says, since wars begin in the minds of men. Enough. Not, Enough. not women, not women. Enough. that's right. No, no, I know, I know, I know. Um, it's men, yeah? I, I know. Um, we have not... <laughs> I knew it's coming. We have not brought in the gender issue at all into this discussion. And, you know, I mean, it's been fascinating how it's been avoided actually, in the coverage of the war um, on both sides. Uh, there was actually an unprecedented uh, coverage of uh, Russian mothers in an appeal um, on Russian television um, about their sons missing in action or husbands, uh, children missing. Um, and and it, was, it was really under, underplayed in, in, in the Western press. Um, Okay, so my, my short answer to your last question is, we need more women in leadership, okay? Um, my longer, <laughs> um, my, my, my deeper question, and it's related to this, um, I'm wondering about um, the implosion or the cracks that are emerging in Putin's rule at home, including, for example, those women that I saw on, on television the other day. I wonder um, how much, that internal threat increases the chances of nuclear war on the rest of us. Because in order for him to maintain his position at home, to maintain his power at home, and there are things happening under the surface, um, he might need to do something like that. Uh, I'm, I, I really would like to know your, your, your opinions on that, whether he would take that step in order to maintain power as he sees um, more and more cracks in his structures, internal structures. And then related to that, I have heard, or I have read that there are a lot of inside channels to the Kremlin and to the Russian leadership and actually um, to his inner circle by Western intelligence, um, probably operatives that have been placed around Putin for, for decades and decades, and I wonder um, if that is going to have any kind of impact also on, on what happens uh, in, in the larger scenario for, for the future of the conflict. Ambassador Briggs, would you like to contribute? Well, I had the chance. I had the chance to, to meet Mr. Putin quite regularly. Um, and uh, a few things seem to be proven now. He's not a person to have too much ideology. He's looking for success, strength, success. So he's ba balancing between different positions all the time. Uh, and he has a small circle of people around him. Uh, and uh, so there is no, so far there are no cracks that, that one could see in the circle. What has become very obvious is what we expected before, that he has to balance now totally towards the military strategic people, the seal of Niki, and not do the oligarchs, economic oligarchs. This is presumably will get more and more important the longer the war lasts and the more resources he needs for keeping up this war. Um, if you ask me whether the, we, there are inroads of Western intelligence into the Kremlin, I don't think so. There were hardly any real inroads in the Soviet time, which was even more difficult. Um, well, there are inroads maybe the other way around. You, yeah, you have. I wanted to ask about that. Yeah, the, uh, rather the other way around. Uh, or if you want to. But let's say number two of the Russian Orthodox Church sits now in Budapest. Yeah, because That's the boss, strange. because the boss who is an experienced cigarette smuggler <laughs> and was serving uh, uh, in the KGB uh, was denied originally entry to the EU, and the Hungarians saved his soul. Bravo. 
Yes, I know. Uh, and, and, but I wonder why the num former number two is now bishop in, yeah, in, in, in Hungary. Uh, so I don't see that there is a real change or possibility of change in the, in, in the mindset because of, uh, of the outer structure and the possible influence of other people on this small circle of people around Mr. Putin. May, may I ask you, while you have the mic with you, is that uh, we learn day by day that one algorithm of eliminating the economic uh, oligarchs is by an algorithm called uh, defenetration. Uh, where all of a sudden uh, the window is open and the wind is blowing and blows out uh, the, the, the opponents. That's one option. The second option is people talk already about the, the Brutus effect. That perhaps, uh, uh, you know, in all the military things, a Brutus is coming inside. What are the probabilities that it happens? Well, uh, Sir Richard already, is, or someone spoke about loss of control. That we feel that we control things, also the military, and there's a loss of control. I think Mr. Putin has to realize that control is a tricky thing. And there may be the fruitos around everywhere. What he does with the Wagner Group, or Prigozhin, yes. or yeah, yeah. Mr. Kadyrov, yes. that ca can get out of hand, certainly. Um, but so far, he has been chuckling the balls in the air quite actually successfully, one has to say. Uh, and he proves also something, in, also in this word, a very general idea. Politics trumps the economy. Politics trumps the economy in the given geopolitical situation. And this is a very, very clear example of this. Um, but whether this will continue or uh, or uh, Mr. Putin uh, will, will be, well, whatever you call it, uh, will lose his power, I'm not sure. My own prediction is that without uh, Russia, without Putin, there will be no real change. Yeah. For real change, you need a Russia without Putin. Absolutely. Uh, so Richard, this is what you would like to contribute to? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, if I may just touch on morality. Um, I'm going to be really honest here. We all love it. Nice to have. But when it comes to international relations, it cuts no ice. It's about power. As that splendid message from um, Hobbes said, covenants without the sword are but words. And I would say, absolutely, you're right, 100% right, that morally we should support the Ukraine, the Ukrainians. But actually, there's another point here, which is in, it is in our self-interest to support Ukraine. It's in the interest of our security and the security of every European country to see Ukraine succeed. And for that reason, we should be giving them the tools to do the job. So I would appeal to that rather than to morality, although I 100% agree. On the nuclear threat, um, I think we have to take this really seriously. I think, J.D., your postulation that in an act of desperation, as he sees Crimea falling to a Ukrainian offensive, let's play that scenario out. He absolutely could. So we have to take it really seriously. Um, because it would be catastrophic in the, certainly in the immediate vicinity of a, of a nuclear release or release of a nuclear, a tactical nuclear weapon would be catastrophic. I mean, ironically, and we shouldn't take that away, assume, you know, in, in the overall military scale of things, it probably would not alter the balance too much because, it, you know, Ukraine, you're talking about a thousand, a thousand kilometer frontage. It's a big country. However, it would be a catastrophe. So the so what, I think, is number one, I don't know if there are intelligence agencies feeding lines in to the Kremlin. I don't know about that. But I do know that the message is very, very clear from the likes of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Miley, to uh, Gerasimov. And I am sure that whatever 
uh, avenues of communication are there are being used to convey a very serious message that should there be any hint of the use of nuclear, Russia should expect massive conventional pain as a result of some a, a reaction. And I think it's inconceivable. I think NATO would have to in, get, engage Russia conventionally and could destroy at a stroke, Russian conventional capabilities in Ukraine, and probably that would be the end of the Black Sea Fleet as well. And so the pain for Russia would be massive. But that message has got to be conveyed with strength, and unblinkingly so. And I don't think we've got that yet. Um, my final point is on women in leadership positions. Absolutely. I contrast the redoubtable, clear statements of strength from the Estonian Prime Minister with the cautious d dribbling from a number of male European political leaders. So let's have more Estonian Prime Ministers than her like. Mm -hmm. right. and, 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 and the irony is that um, Putin respected Angela Merkel probably more than a lot of the other Western leaders. Oh, uh, well, there's a difference. That's a different, that's, that's a different ball game. Angela Merkel respected the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Don't forget it. No. Okay, Fadi. Okay, grab, grab the mic. Grab the mic. Oh yeah, I know, I know. Sean, Sean comes next. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sean. You will come next. Maybe sort of Sean. I think the biggest mistake is, you know, two big words of the West, our world, after 89-91, was that we never understood ourselves. We never understood deeply what happened. We, never, we could never really understand Gorbachev's gesture. No. The, the unilateral withdrawal of, of, of Soviet army. Because he understood the economic no, no, situation. That, 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 and, and that was a promise. I mean, Kohl and, and Genscher and Mitterrand. And the Gorbachev was celebrated in Paris, in London, and, and in Brussels. Everywhere he gave speeches about the common European village and home for, for years. And the only thing, I mean, he was naive, obviously. He believed that the promise of the Western world that, okay, instead of competition, uh, we should go for cooperation in, in, in military terms. But never after that, a new military, uh, a new world order based upon, um, upon military security was created. And the United States wanted to believe and told us that it's possible to have a unilateral monopolar world order. It was not possible. Sorry. When the United States could, could win wars and won a lot of wars, could never build peace and democracy. Right. Look at Afghanistan, etc. And so this long misunderstanding, it took 30 years. And now it, it, it is a boomerang effect. And Gorbachev started as a, as, 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 as a follower of Yeltsin. Yeltsin introduced him. Yeltsin was pro Russian democracy with his alcoholic way, but he, he was, in a way, trying to continue Russia's way towards the West or, or Europe. And, but that was a, sw a switch between 2004, 3 and 2008, when the whole interpretation, reinterpretation of the word changed, both in the United States and in Russia. Trump said something very similar. We are first. And that's what Putin says. There's a Russian mir, yeah? a, a Russian empire, a Russian truce. And that start, he started to use Dugin, uh, my sword is my prey, my prey is my sword. That means that if we kill, that's not a sin. We create our word. And Putin, I mean, Trump is creating the American word. And that is the, 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 the destruction, self-destruction of our entire word in political terms. Mm. Now, how to come out of this, I do not know, but I think we should continue where we finished. Yeah? We should, we should bring, bring up these threads from 1991. Well, the, here's the problem. You know, what Putin wants is that all the Central and Eastern European countries go back to the 1999 uh, situation. Therefore, they jump out of, uh, uh, of NATO. Uh, they, don't, uh, so they, they act like they were before a buffer zone. I, I think lead my ribs, and uh, uh, Sir, John, uh, Sir Richard will uh, uh, perhaps uh, put me in order. NATO would never, as a defense uh, alliance, would never attack Russia. 
never. Because the, 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 those guys are honest. Uh, and this is statement one. Statement number two, the security of, the, of Europe, including the European uh, Union, needs the United States. Otherwise, we would be facing 6,300 nuclear weapons in the Ukraine area. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, this is the reality. And, and Putin was not uh, ready to accept it, but perhaps... Uh, yeah, but, but it reminds me a, a story from the Brezhnev years that his, his secretary goes to his office and says, well, Mr. Secretary, the Pope uh, was protesting uh, that we have uh, ordered a, a new uh, armored division to Afghanistan, and that's immoral. Yes, says Brezhnev. But how many armored divisions he has? Yeah, Stalin already. Yeah, yeah. Well, Stalin did that. Yeah. Sean, sorry about uh, beating sorry, you. Sorry, I got a message, I think. Ivana, can you read it? I'm sorry. Not in the least. Um, I want to come at this from a slightly different angle, if I may, because firstly, I agree both on the grotesque violation of moral rules and secondly i agree that without the ability to be able to bolster morality with force um the obvious remark was is as valid today as it was at the time that uh, thomas Hobbes spoke it but i think the the fundamental question that we've all got to deal with is what happens next do we have to prove that violating Article 2.4 of the UN Charter and peremptory rules of international law will be met with consequences. Yes, we have to prove that. It's not up for discussion. It's a, it's a, it's a central element. But at some point, after whatever has been done, then we have to put not Humpty Dumpty back together again, but we have to create an order that will enable states with capacity to be able to coexist on a single planet. And unless we're going to go for full-scale nuclear war, that thing called the Russian Federation is still going to have an awful lot of nuclear weapons. So the idea that because of his grotesque violation of law and morality, he can be ignored or his successor can be ignored, is not plausible. If you have a look at, I'm not going to go around the world, it'll take too long, but let's just do Europe. After the first wave of the religious wars, we had the Treaty of Augsburg in 1555. After the second wave, we had the Treaty of Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. After the Napoleonic Wars, we had the Congress of Vienna in 1814-15. After the First World War, we had Versailles, not terribly successful for a whole variety of different reasons, which we can't canvas now. And then after the Second World War, we had Bretton Woods first and then San Francisco. Now, all of those, with the exception of the Second World War, where the elimination of the Nazi regime was deemed to be essential and where two atomic weapons were used against the Japanese in order to avoid further loss of life of allied forces in the Pacific. In all of the others, we reached a compromise at the end of the day. The underlying principles of those compromises were that you created an order that transcended the circumstances that had given rise to the crisis. And if one, I'll take Vienna as a simple example, because it was probably the most comprehensive of the ones that we're discussing. Talleyrand was part of the deal struck <coughs> by Metternich with the support of Castle and Castle Rea, by definition, was acting under Palmerston's instructions. So something like that is going to happen. And we're going to have to determine what the rules of a new order are going to be. 
Hobbes famously, and we've quoted him probably more than we should have in one discussion already, but Hobbes famously said that the state of nature produced life that was nasty, brutish, and short. We presumably don't want to go back there. Locke and Rousseau and lots of others came up with the concept of a social contract preeminently on an imperial national level, <clears throat> but nonetheless as between rulers and ruled. Kant argued for the application of law across larger systems, and he was building obviously on what Hichel de Groot, or Grotius, if we use the Latin, had put together in the Eurebeliac Parkis. Now it goes without saying that Putin has violated practically everything in the jus ad bellum as well as the jus in bellum, to take the two elements of Grotius. But the simple reality is we're going to have to put something together again on the back end of it. And the fundamental question that we have to ask now is what consequences are we prepared to bear in order to be able to create that level of stability? Hedley Bull famously called a global society as something that comprised a group of states conscious of common interests and common values, conceiving themselves to be bound by a common set of rules in their relations to one another. It's a wonderful idea, but we're one hell of a long way from that point in respect of Russia at the present. But if you have a look, and I've posted it for everyone to look at, anyone who's interested, if you have a look at the comparison of the Russian proposals to the US and NATO on the 15th of December, 2022, and the US responses in January, uh, sorry, 2021, and the US responses in January of 2022, this is an arms control association, parallel uh, rendition of the two sets of proposals. You could quite, I don't want to say easily, but quite simply using Astana and other OSCE documents, you could quite easily construct a security order. Now we're not there, there's a lot of water that has to flow under the bridge, hopefully without too many additional civilian lives at least being lost. But we've actually got to get our heads around what the order looks like when it's over. I'll stop there. All right. Thank you, Sean. Mr. Ambassador. Uh, uh, yes, I agree. There will be a, a compromise and there must be a compromise at the end of this. Uh, but a few things are important. Uh, you said the Congress of Vienna model is the best one. That's like Henry Kissinger also said, this must be Congress of Vienna. But the Congress of Vienna model was that we sent the ruler to an island. So that means an end of the rule of Putin, more or less. Uh, I'm not sure we can do this, but we can decide on this. It doesn't look likely. But it's a good idea. It's a very good idea it would be a good idea. I don't know which island. But <laughs> ask the Croatian ambassador. He knows islands. Uh, but I do. All right, we can continue later if you wish. Now, we need the accountability of, right. of all those who commit these war crimes. Right. I don't think that we can, can right. leave it without that. And that's Absolutely. what the Estonian Prime Minister, Lady the Prime Minister, Absolutely. also the Finnish Prime Minister and others mm. have said. That's important. The strength today to find a compromise and accountability afterwards. Yeah, well, related to that, and I would like to turn to the audience. Uh, this is the, well, sooner or later, all wars, all wars come to an end, sooner or later. But how will that likely happen? In this war, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm also turning to Sir Richard, will uh, resource fatigue set in, or the lack of uh, resources, followed by very long diplomatic horse trading, concessions in, in territories, in governance and uh, election systems? Is there a realistic, or will there be, a realistic compromise. Does, does a compromise exist in this case? Could you make a, a, a compromise with Adolf Hitler, for instance? Or will it end like the Korean War, where there was a demarcation line, uh, and that's it, and still there is no peace agreement, 
and is a, a, an area of uh, constant um, conflict. And if there is a peace, who will, uh, who, who, will, who will ensure it? That, by definition, would be the United Nations as the only agency, uh, international agency, that has the mandate, but not the resources. Uh, very few people know that the, the overall budget of the United Nations system, FAO, WMO, UNESCO, WHO, the regular budget that is being contributed according to an asset scheme by governments is less than that of the New York Police Department. The, the military thing is different. Uh, and the peace, peacekeeping forces, that's a, uh, that's, a, that's a different thing which is by order of magnitude higher. If the UN uh, is there to supervise uh, a potential peace agreement, uh, will the Russians be still a, a part of the Security Council as permanent members, the P5? When I joined the United Nations 33 years ago, still uh, we went to the Bubu shop. That was uh, Butros Butros, uh, was the Secretary General. And then later on we went to the coffee shop, that was Kofi Annan. And Kofi started this review uh, of the uh, UN governance mechanism, stating that the, 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 the decision-making mechanism is not uh, uh, democratic. Everybody is equal, but there are some who are more equal than the other. And those are the members of the, uh, of the Security Council, the permanent members. Now, as we see now, the Russians are blocking the decisions of the, the Security Council in a very well-calculated way. Now, un until they, they are there, there's going to be no peace. So what is the option? Well, perhaps we'll follow the model of the nation of the leagues of League of Nations, and the UN is collapsing uh, to to rebuild it. So these are the kind of questions I think we have to think seriously. And thank you very much for your attention. And I close with this optimistic message.